Welcome to the ninth season of the Combustion Chronicles podcast, where bold leaders combine with big ideas to make life better for all of us. I'm your host, Sean Nason, CEO of Offer Health and founder of Mofi. This season is all about amplifying the voices of badass women leaders in the healthcare industry who are influencing change by thinking big, putting people first, and not being okay with the status quo. Experience matters, culture matters, and revenue matters. That's why it's time to unite to ignite a people-first business revolution, especially industries that affect all of us like healthcare. Ariane Dowdell is Vice President and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas, where she's responsible for leading the vision for unparalleled safety, quality service, and innovation by stewarding system-wide DEI strategy, implementation, and development through key partnerships. Prior to Houston Methodist, Ariane worked in higher education where she held leadership positions at Syracuse University, Virginia Commonwealth University, and the Rockefeller University. She served as both communications director and president of the National Association of Black Automotive Suppliers, is a former attorney, and previously practiced as a labor and employment lawyer in Detroit, Michigan. Welcome to the Combustion Chronicles, Ariane. Hi, good afternoon, Sean. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Wow. So you've lived in different parts of the country. Yes. And have had an impactful career that has evolved over time. I love it because I've had one of those, like I'm in my fifth career moments in my life. So what's been the driving force for you, Ariane, that has kept you moving forward in your career in so many different industries, in so many different positions, that now you work in probably one of the hardest industries there is moving initiatives that, as we know, are so powerful to the organization. I'm on my fifth career, too, it feels like. I started my career actually in television, which is all that I thought um, I would do forever. And so I've always wanted to um, tell the stories of people. And my every career I've had has always been centered around people. And so, you know, as I've gotten older and become a mother and a caregiver for two parents as they've aged, I think that my desire and my passion for representing people and telling that story has just evolved in a different kind of way. Um, I've never chased a title in my life. It's always just been about making sure that, you know, people feel like they're heard and they're seen. And that's, you know, been through TV, through practicing law, representing students, right? And now I'm in healthcare. And so it's kind of come full circle. But I think sometimes my biggest driving focus is the days that I'm really tired and wonder if I'm making an impact, right? And then that kind of motivates me more to get up the next morning and keep doing uh, what it is that I get to do every day, which I'm really blessed to be able to do. Well, I love it. I was a musician. So kind of like (laughs) TV, I was a musician, came to healthcare, actually went to higher ed and came back to healthcare. So okay. you understand, right? <laughs> I, I understand. And there's yeah. a reason that I left higher ed, and we can discuss that over drinks at a much later <laughs> date in our life. Really, I mean, we've just talked about it. You've had such a fantastic array of roles throughout your career. How did working in all these roles prepare you for working in the DEI space, which is still such a I'm going to say this and it may sound wrong, but it's not meant wrong. So many organizations do DEI to check the box, particularly in healthcare. I have seen this a lot. And you're in one of the biggest, most well-known hospital systems in our country at Houston Methodist Hospital. What has prepared you for this and why DEI? Yeah, so um, when I lived in Detroit back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I represented automotive suppliers, it was supplier diversity at that point, right? But it was a different form of DEI. So for me, um, this work has been going on for a really long time. But as you mentioned earlier, I've lived around the country in different places. I've had an opportunity to reach 
and be around students of different economic, you know, backgrounds and educational backgrounds. I've had an opportunity to represent clients. And so I think all these different facets, different people of different genders, right, different ages, uh, religions, et cetera, has helped me really prepare for this role. But I'll also say that living in on the East Coast primarily and then in the Midwest and now down in the South, that experience alone of moving around and seeing you know, what's so important to people, really a lot of it is dependent on where you live and what surrounds you in your community has helped me a lot. And so I feel like that has all really prepared me. And I had a parent that worked in healthcare for many years. So I always kind of understood like the inner workings of HR and healthcare. And so bringing all those things together, I think was preparation for what it is that I do now every day, which is representing and listening to people. And at the end of the day, everyone's needs are kind of the same, right? People want to be heard and they want to be seen and they want to feel valued, whether you're the employee or if you're the patient coming into the hospital, we all have the same common need. And so in all the different roles that I've had, my role is never to impose my values and my beliefs, but it's to make sure that others feel like they have an opportunity to do so in a safe space, right, where it makes sense. And so it's kind of been like stair steps for me building up um, over the years that have prepared me and with 30,000 plus over employee, you know, employees here at Houston Methodist, that's all um, thankfully gotten me ready for this job. And I love that you reference back to your supplier diversity days. I'm Native American, so MOFI, my consulting group, is a minority-owned, certified minority-owned business. And the company that I actually am CEO of today, Offer Health, is minority-owned. So I appreciate your supplier diversity, and now I even appreciate more in the space that you're in. So what's been your biggest surprise or aha in transitioning into the DEI space, especially in healthcare? Yeah, you know, um, there's been a lot of surprises. I'm not going to act like, ooh, I knew everything that was going to happen because that wouldn't be honest. I'm not going to tell you a story, Sean. Um, (laughs) So there's been a lot of surprises. There's a couple. I think the first is um, overall in healthcare in general, I think we're behind the mark on DEI and what that means and a full understanding of the impact in healthcare um, compared to say higher ed, which you said you're familiar with, um, that it's been around in higher ed for such a long time. And so there's a different understanding of the way it's worked in higher ed is different, but um, I was definitely surprised starting in healthcare about how much of a learning curve there would be for people, not myself so much of what it means um, to have a DEI program in a hospital, what it means for employees, what it means for patients. But I will say the one thing that I've been really excited about is that it's been received so well here at Houston Methodist, despite the fact that it's still fairly new. Uh, We have something called I care values here. And so we live by these I care values where it's about integrity and respect and accountability and compassion, excellence. And so it's been nice to be able to intertwine those pieces in as we talk about DEI. So like that foundation was already here, um, but there's definitely been a bit of a learning curve for people to understand why this department exists. So um, overall, I think that's been my biggest surprise because I thought more people would know uh, what the D, the E, and the I mean in full context, right? And that's still happening here where we're explaining it every single day just for people to understand it, you know, at its core. Yeah, because I think there's this misconception in healthcare that DEI is really around race, exactly. and that, but it's so much more than that. And I love it. And I can't wait to hear more and how you're doing it in this space, because I think it is so true. Healthcare is so far behind. And again, a lot of organizations have checked the box, but still not have made the initial really the transformation. And and we talk a lot about, and I talk a lot about, about mindsets. Yes. It's shift, right? And it's a mindset shift when you move into this DEI space. So in so many ways, as I've got to know you and watch you um, from afar, we're really kindred spirits um, when it comes to thought leadership. And especially when we're invited to speak at conferences, I typically like to blow shit up. I tell people when I speak at a conference and challenge people. So when you're on the speaking circuit and and you're only allowed a short amount of time to present, which is really hard for me, or honest about that one, uh, what do you focus on on your presentation then um, when you're talking about this? You know, I really try to focus on what our successes have been. 
I think it's easy to talk about what you want to do and talk about hypotheticals, but I look at um, our team here and I focus on what are our successes? What is it that we've accomplished in less than three years that I've had this team pulled together? And then I talk about where we're going, right? I don't talk about all the things that we want to do. Um, I talk about what it is that we've done, what it is the impact that we're making internally as well as externally, because I think if you don't do that, it does seem like you're checking a box. And that's the one thing that I will personally never do that I don't believe in doing. And so I need to make sure that that is clearly reflected when I'm out speaking to people that this is what we have done and where we're going. And we're not just checking a box, but what we're doing is here to make a lasting change. That's really, really Mm. um, important to me. So You know, I talk about um, our $25 million grants. I talk about the impact we're having in the community. I talk about the work that we're doing on health equity, um, the dashboards we've created. So those that like data understand what those data sets mean, how they go to our CEOs, right? How we utilize that data. I don't talk about hiring quotas. I don't talk about those kinds of things. I talk about mentoring, how we have scholarships um, for young minority students that come here and underrepresented groups. Those are the things that matter. Those are the things that are actually going to move the needle at the end of the day where when I'm not here anymore and nobody says DEI, the lasting impact, right, is still going to be there. So that's when I don't have a lot of time, that's my focus. What are the successes that we've made here at Houston Methodist? I hope our listeners are listening to these nuggets and gems that you are dropping along the way um, around this and and your philosophy and, and really your mindset around it. A nice smile can be pleasing if you can get the dental care to help create one. Medicaid kids don't always have a lot to smile about. It's challenging for them to see a dentist. Offer Health was started to increase access to health care for people who don't have it. Offer Smile MD Business partners with dental practices to get these kids seen faster. Smile MD's three-person care team brings hospital-grade anesthesia to the dental offices so those kids can be on their way to getting the smiles most of us may take for granted. Offer Health, creating connections, improving lives, care you deserve. Learn more at OfferHealth.com. That's O-F-F-O-R. So when you're interacting with audiences, when you're speaking at these conferences, give me the one or two questions um, that you get asked the most. Sure. How many people do you have on your team? What are your resources? (laughs) What is your reporting structure? Who do you report to? And how engaged is your board? Those are always the top questions that I get. Okay. So let's run through those real fast. All right. right. How big is your team? I have 10 people on the team. I probably could use about 20. Okay. Okay. Always need more people. What is your reporting structure? I report directly to the president of this hospital, uh, Dr. Mark Boom. I hope you hear that, leaders that listen to this. That shows how important initiative is, is where it reports to. Just going to say, drop that a little bit. So, (laughs) and so, and a huge shout out to your president who has showed how valuable this is by you. Yes. And the third, oh, I just lost. What was the third one? Oh, board involvement. But how's your board around this? Board is completely committed to this. We actually have a DEI subcommittee of our board of directors that I report out to monthly. They actually go through any trainings we have. They see every single thing that my department does before it goes out and take it back to our larger boards. And then I present to each of our community hospital boards as well um, so that they remain engaged in the work that it is that we do. Wow. So, full commitment. It's a lot of work, but let me tell you, it's worth it, Sean. It's worth it. Oh them engaged. That, that's so, so powerful. Love it. And so we have this little saying, and we, we talked, we're in our ninth season here, about being maverick-minded and human-obsessed, right? And where I feel like we're a little bit more kindred, even more, is putting people first and meeting people where they are. Um, I, I talk about this a lot, that if you get the human experience right, that you'll get the numbers that you need, right? So if you're doing a Venn diagram of the healthcare industry and DEI initiatives, it seems like the overlapping section would be people. But how do you connect with humans to improve healthcare and make it more diverse, equitable, and inclusive? Absolutely. People are at the center, right, of that Venn diagram when I picture it in my mind. Um, The focus 
are people. It doesn't matter if you're the employee, the patient, or somebody that every person walking the street has the potential to become a patient to me here at Houston Methodist. And so that's just my mindset. But we connect through storytelling. It's not enough for me to stand in front of people and say, this is what we should do. This is what we need to do. But instead, we take those stories from our patients and from our employees that speak to what is the heart of DEI? How did we help a patient? How did an employee that um, had a reaction, an interaction, excuse me, with a patient that maybe was racially charged or gender related or ethnically charged? How do we connect with our patients and our employees to make sure that they're valued and heard? That's really how we connect with people in this setting. And we do it through other programs that we have. um, And it tends to work here really well. We also do it by communicating out to people all across uh, internal and external through our communications channels. We do lots of videos. And so that storytelling piece um, has kind of been that nugget. I firmly believe that Our team kind of just lays that foundation for here's what we need to do, but our best advocates are the people that tell those stories and then go out around the hospital to talk about what this means in the broader sense on a day-to-day basis. And the power storytelling, I don't understand why we don't do that better in healthcare. I'm just going to say- Then it's not me, right? It's not me standing in front of them saying, here's what you should do. It's somebody else telling that same impactful story and how it may have touched them, how it may have touched a patient in a different way. And at the end of the day, what we do is put the patient at the center of everything we do every day, whether you're clinical or non-clinical, that's why we're all here. And so um, storytelling can do wonders. It can do wonders. And I love it. I actually just, uh, I wrote an email uh, very recently to the associates at Offer Health that said, I want to stop using the terminology clinical and non-clinical. Because we are all part of the care team, and we are all here to make that patient's experience the best that it can be. And I think we've done ourselves an injustice in the industry to say, oh, those are clinical people. These are non-clinical people. Not much different than higher ed, right? Like, these are these are the faculty, and these are the administration and administrative people, and, you know, very separate. So once we get this diverse voice, right? in the conversation. And we talk about this in a book that uh, two very dear friends of mine uh, wrote with me, Michael Harper and Robin Glasgow, who is in this season as well. And we get this voices in the conversation about proving healthcare, right? How do we make sure that these diverse voices are still listened to and heard? Because you can get them to the table, but it doesn't mean they people listen to it. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways. Um, it's something I think about often, accountability, right? It starts mm-hmm. with accountability. And I think that we have to keep checking in and holding people accountable. It's not enough to just let people speak and then have no accountability for our leaders. But for us here in healthcare, you know, we have to look at patient outcomes. We have to listen to people. We have to you know, wave that flag when that accountability piece is failing. But then I also think we have to take a step back when we think about healthcare and look at our communities and see if our communities are beginning to thrive. And so I think oftentimes in any sector that we're in, you know, we focus on just that sector. And so we need to realize that while we may be in the business of helping folks feel better, we have to understand the importance of economic empowerment, right? healthy eating, all these different areas and organizations need to start coming together more that way because that's where that accountability piece is really going to make a change overall in healthcare when we have those voices at the table to understand the needs and the wants of the people in our community. And so I think that's really how we're going to make sure that the diverse voices are being heard is to be accountable, begin to work together and start working outside of our silos in the community to improve all aspects of people's lives. I don't think we can do just one thing by ourselves. I think we truly have to work together and hold each other accountable. Again, some great gems and nuggets for our listeners. I hope they're listening to that. So as I mentioned, you know, this season is about amazing women leaders in healthcare and We also added something a little different this season that I'm absolutely loving because uh, the mind power that comes from um, all of our guests this season, it's this two minute drill that we're going to do and we're going to ideate. And for our listeners, you know, we use a methodology and a mindset around human centered design. Some of it call, some people call it design thinking. 
that's a whole nother conversation. But in this methodology, we use statements around how might we. That's part to me of a DEI thing as well. How might we collaborate and, and move problems forward? And so before we jump into the last questions of the day, I want to take two minutes. Okay. Um, and I got my phone and I'm getting a set for two minutes. And I'm going to read a how might we statement to you, um, Ariane. And I want you to just start ideating around it. I may jump in. I may sit and listen. But I want to hear from your heart and, you know, blow things up, have your magic wand, don't allow any constraints on this, but just to really ideate around this. So are you ready for this? I think so. I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Nervous, but I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Okay. How might we involve more people of color in healthcare leadership roles? Go. For so many years, and this is me ideating, folks, including myself, have been given a limit on how far we can soar. So how might we get more people involved is to allow people to soar to their fullest potential. So what does that look like to me? That looks like educating youth. That looks like providing opportunities within the healthcare system for young generations and people early in their careers to see folks that look like me in these positions. How might we uh, change this? It's to tell people to stop being so scared to have somebody that doesn't look like them sitting in the C-suite. And if they are, to own it for a change and know that it's okay to be scared, but it's going to change. How might we change this, start really explaining to people and requiring them to understand what the D, the E, and the I means, because I could change what those letters are at any given point in time, and I still would be saying the same thing. We might do a better job if we all take some time and give back. I'm obsessed with giving back. I'm obsessed with mentoring people. And I firmly believe if every single person was required to carry somebody on their shoulders, it would be a different picture for leadership and healthcare. That's my how might we ideation. Uh, I, I, so I want to add to that. How might we, it's not just bring the seat to the table. And, and I've heard this said before, but you prepare the table. Let someone else prepare the table different than what we're used right. to, right? right. Like Absolutely. Th that's when you break the glass ceilings. That's when you break the systemic racism, everything that we're talking about here. Wow. I love it. See? And now my, my little thing just said, yeah, <laughs> talking about it. Awesome. All right. Well, we have come to this point where we do these things called the combustion questions. So three randomly selected questions given to me by my AI robot named Michael. And I am just reading them for the very first time when I read them to you. So okay. are you ready for your combustion questions? Yes, this is nerve wracking, Sean. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Combustion question number one. Okay. If you won the lottery, what would you do first? I've had this plan since I was a teenager. I would actually take a rundown hotel, rebuild it, um, allow homeless uh, the homeless to live in there for six months to a year, and then own several fast food chains to allow them to begin to earn um, money to set aside for full housing and employment opportunities. That's a given. I know what I would do. I'd start it the first day I won. That's like a mic drop moment. Like, how do you even... <laughs> How do you even plan since high school? And like, I'm like, okay. Yep. Yeah, I've had it planned since high school <laughs> and I'm not young. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Question number two Would you rather go to a sporting event, a concert, or a movie? I would actually go to a sporting event where there was somebody as the opening act so I could get a two in one. I try to go to concerts whenever I can, but I used to commentate sports in college. And so that is where my career began. And so, yeah. Let's go NFL season. I'm excited. Oh, you're you're getting ready. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Great. All right. Question number three. What do you think about magazines? I miss them. There's a power to the written word. There's a power to visual interpretation and telling stories. And I hate the fact that there's not those magazines to sit and hold on to. My mother used to hold on to jet magazines growing up and like save them because she wanted to go back and look at them. I am a fan of visuals and the written word. Again, I'm all about storytelling. If I could do it all day long, I would. Okay. And I haven't done this yet. I don't think this season. What's the one piece of advice that you would give to women 
wanting to move into healthcare leadership and into the executive role? Know your worth, know you're enough, and know that no matter what you do, you're never going to please anyone. But if you live with integrity and have values, you'll always sleep well at night, even on your hardest days. I never leave work worrying that I'm not being true to myself and honest with everyone that I'm with. And I think if you do that and you live your life, whether it's in leadership or not, in an authentic manner, it's okay if everyone doesn't like you, but everyone will respect you. And that's what I pray happens uh, when I leave this earth, that I will be known as somebody that's respected for the work that I do every single day. Beth Nugget, you left us. Beth Nugget, you left us. So. Ariane, I'm assuming if people want to follow you on LinkedIn, that's the best place. They can see your thought leadership there. I know I follow you and I love having you part of my community there. So thank you. I'm There's not even enough words, I don't think, for what this last 20 something minutes has been. But thank you. Stay safe. Be well. And I can't wait till we talk again. Thank you for having me, Sean. This has been fun. I feel like I can loosen up now. The stress of the questions is over. But uh, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Combustion Chronicles. If you've enjoyed this episode, please take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review. Remember that I'm always looking to meet more big thinking mavericks. So let's keep the conversation going by connecting on LinkedIn. If you want to discover more about human-obsessed, maverick-minded leadership, go to mofi.co or go to experienceevangelist.com. To learn more about my mission to challenge leaders to blow up outdated, siloed systems and rebuild them with an aligned, human-first approach. You can also learn more about OfferHealth's commitment to reimagining outdated healthcare models at offerhealth.com. As always, stay safe, be well, and keep blowing shit up.